Line number one, the first law of thermodynamics, tells us that matter cannot be created or destroyed. No, the first law states that the total energy of a closed system is constant. Matter and energy can change their form all they want, and even be created and destroyed as in the Casimir effect, as long as the total amount of matter and energy in the universe does not change. That's what a teacher is supposed to do. Take the complex and explain it where the average person can get it. Line number two, the second law of thermodynamics says everything tends toward disorder. No, it says that the net entropy of the universe must increase. That's a very different thing, which I have already explained in my video, Creationism and the Second Law. The second law of thermodynamics, and we must hurry here, says everything is tending toward disorder. Now, there are several different ways this is phrased, okay? Some people say, uh, in any exchange, there's a net loss. You know, several ways this is, this is phrased. Line number three, the Big Bang Theory, says that about 20 billion years ago all the dust in space started drawing together into this little bitty dot, and it was spinning real fast. Finally, it exploded out into space. Wrong. Forgetting the fact that it's really 13.7 billion years ago, nothing drew in because matter, space, and time were all created in the Big Bang. So there was no dust, no space for it to be in, and no way for it to draw together. It didn't explode out into space, it was an explosion of space itself. And there is no sense in which it could be said to be spinning, because there is nothing else that it could be spinning in relation to. Another one, called the Nebula Hypothesis, says this cloud of dust all got together. Of course, obviously the question is, where did all this dust come from, right? But all this dirt in the universe got together in a little bitty tiny dot, and it kept getting drawn in tighter and tighter, and of course it began to spin. They say this nebula began to sp it spun faster and faster, and finally it exploded. Line number four, this is called the conservation of angular momentum. One of the laws says in a frictionless environment, if pieces fly off a spinning object, they tend to spin the same direction, because the outer part is already spinning faster than the inner part. The law of conservation of angular momentum merely states that in a closed system, the sum of the momentum is constant. Objects can end up spinning in different directions as long as the rate of spin makes the total angular momentum of the system match what it was originally. Oh, and the outer part does not spin faster than the inner part. That's just silly. If you can imagine the circle spinning, the outside has to move faster than the inside. It's got further to go in the same amount of time. All of these so far are basic scientific principles that he would have seen if he had even bothered to look them up. So either he's deliberately lying about what they say, or he's lying about being informed about them. And he has been corrected by many others, so they can only be deliberate distortions. Line number five. All of the ancient astronomers said that Sirius was a red star. Today it is a white dwarf. Hovind knows perfectly well that Sirius is a binary, since he put this fact in his own slide, as I showed in my video, Kent Hovind's Age of the Earth Rebutted. Sirius B is the white dwarf. Sirius A is the brightest star in the night sky, whereas white dwarfs aren't even visible without a telescope. Um, one atheist wrote me a, a very nasty letter about my mention of Sirius being a white star. And he said, don't you know Sirius is a binary star? There are two of them going around. I wrote back and said, yeah, and they're both white. So what's your point? <laughs> it appears to be a binary star, two stars spinning around each other, and they're both white stars. So, uh, just so you know that in case somebody questions you on that. Yes, it's binary, but they're both white.
Line number 6. In 1954, Isaac Asimov calculated that there would be at least 54 feet of dust on the moon because the moon is billions of years old. They calculated the accumulation rate to be one inch of dust every 10,000 years. Asimov's calculation was a maximum value, but Hoven pretends that it was a required value. He also ignores the other studies which correctly predicted the amount of dust on the moon. Line number seven. Evolution is a religion, nothing more, nothing less. Evolution is just something people prefer to believe because of their lifestyle. Hoven knows better. There are many devout Bible-believing Christians who accept evolution, including Dr. Kenneth Miller, author of the foremost textbook on the subject. So why do they believe this stuff? Well, some believe it because that's all they've been taught. Some, their job depends on it. Some, they hope there's no God to answer to. Line number eight. One part of a mammoth was carbon dated at 29,000 years old. Another part is 44,000 years old. Here's two parts of the same animal. That's from USGS Professional Paper number 862. Hoven makes a big mistake here. He cites his source. Creationists are too stupid and too easily duped to check sources, so he's gotten away with it. But if you actually look at the source, you'll see that these measurements are from two different mammoths. The source makes it clear. There is no way Hovind did not know that. Line number nine. Animals with similar density are buried together. Birds are frequently found on top not because birds evolved last, but because birds were the last ones to drown in the flood. If this were the case, then you'd see pterosaurs with ostriches, mammoths with elephants, and similar sized lizards with amphibians. You don't. Actually, maybe fossils are sorted based upon their habitat. You know, it could be the clams are found at the bottom because they're already at the bottom when the flood starts. You know, that's where they live. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're sorted based upon intelligence. As far as anybody can figure out, clams aren't too bright. Maybe they're sorted based upon mobility. Did you know clams can't run very fast? Maybe they're sorted based upon body density. Maybe it's a combination of all those. Don't tell me they're sorted by evolutionary process. That's stupid. Line number 10. There are several swamps in Africa that are still reporting creatures like pterodactyls. They are not as big as they used to be. The 50-footers couldn't fly in today's atmosphere. The air is too thin. This is complete fantasy. No one has ever been able to get a source from Hovind on this, so apparently he just made it up. Plus, the atmosphere has been the same pressure for at least the last 200 million years. Line number 11. I believe in fire-breathing dragons. It is possible to blow fire. You say, what? Yep. It's possible. There is an insect that lives in South Florida and in Central America that is called the bombardier beetle. There is no animal that can blow fire. The bombardier beetle spouts hot chemicals under pressure. This is not fire by any stretch of the most diluted imagination. This beetle has a cannon back near his hind end. He swings it around at the enemy and poosh, blasts his enemy with 212 degree chemicals. 212 degree chemicals. Line number 12. The Lombardier Beetle has two chemicals in storage compartments in his rear end. The chemicals are hydrogen peroxide and hydroquinone. When these two chemicals are mixed together, they explode. Boom. No, they don't. Mix these two chemicals together, and nothing happens. Kent has been shown this demonstration by scientists before, and he continued to repeat the lie. The explosive energy comes from the mixing of two separate fluids, hydroquinones and hydrogen peroxide with oxidative enzymes. Line number 13. He has a third chemical that is mixed in there with him. The third chemical is called the inhibitor. He has a fourth chemical. The fourth chemical is in the outer chamber. He squirts it in at the very last possible second. The fourth chemical is the neutralizer. 
The neutralizer eliminates the inhibitor so the first two chemicals can explode. Is this too complicated? There are no such chemicals in the bombardier beetle. Line number 14. Before the 1800s, almost everybody believed that the world was only six or seven thousand years old. They held to the Christianist or the Christian worldview of history. The Earth being millions of years old creates Darwin by at least a century. Line number 15. One of the first scoffers in the past couple of hundred years was a guy named James Hutton. James Hutton was one of the first men to really propose that the Earth was more than six or seven thousand years old. Not so. In 1779, the Comte du Buffon estimated a minimum age for the Earth at 75,000 years. See, back in 1770, they taught the kids the Earth is 70,000 years old. Of course, the ancient Greeks, Hindus, and others all had beliefs of the Earth being much older as well. Isaac Newton believed that the Earth and the universe were infinitely old. Line number 16. Everything must be interpreted in light of the geologic column. For example, the Jurassic layer contains dinosaur bones. Therefore, if you find a dinosaur bone, it's automatically classified as a Jurassic layer. If this were true, they wouldn't have known ahead of time where to dig to find Tiktaalik. Line number 17. As Darwin read the book about the principles of geology, his faith in scripture was destroyed. Darwin came back a doubter, a skeptic, a scoffer. From Origin of Species. He who believes that each species was independently created, to admit this view is, as it seems to me, to reject a real, for an unreal, or at least for an unknown, cause. It makes the works of God a mere mockery and deception. Line number 18. No, man never had a tail. We have a tailbone, a coccyx. I was in a debate in Huntsville, Alabama against the president of the North Alabama Atheist Association. He got up in front of God and everybody and said, Folks, I've got proof for evolution. Humans have a tailbone they no longer need. I said, uh, Mr. Patterson, I taught biology and anatomy. I happen to know there are nine little muscles that attach to the tailbone, <clears throat> without which you cannot perform some valuable functions. I won't tell you what they all are, but trust me, you need those muscles. I said, now, if you think the tailbone is vestigial, I, Kent Hovind, will pay to have yours removed. <laughs> Bend over. <clears throat> Maybe it was designed to support your colon and support your lower back for posture when you sit, and five or six other things you can read your Gray's Anatomy about. And in the womb, a tail begins to grow and is reabsorbed. Sometimes a human will be born with a full tail, which is generally removed surgically. This is known as an atavism. They say, aren't babies born with tails once in a while? No. Well, that baby's got a tail right there. No, he doesn't. It's not a tail. That's just fatty tissue. There's no bone, no muscle, no cartilage. It's not even lined up with the spine. It has to do with the way the baby develops inside the mother. There's fat around the nervous system to protect it until the bone grows around it. And extremely, generally, the, the fat is resorbed into the system as the baby grows and develops bone. But on extremely rare occasions, the fat is excluded outside the body like a big wart. So what you do, you cut it off, sew it up, put a diaper on the kid, and send him home. It's just nothing like a, it's just like a wart. That's all it is. Cut it off. It's not a tail. Line number 19. Because they cannot find a missing link, many evolutionists have gone to a new theory. The new theory is called punctuated equilibrium. The evolutionists are saying maybe a reptile laid an egg and a bird hatched out, and that is why we cannot find any transitional fossils. Evolution happened in jumps. 
Punk Geek says nothing of the kind. The jumps still take millions of years. Punk Geek just says that evolution happens more quickly in small isolated populations and much more slowly in large populations. This is perfectly in line with Darwin's theory. Stephen Jay Gould himself corrected Hovind on this. Stephen Gould died with a set of my videos on his shelf in his library. I hope he watched them. I donated them to him years ago, way before he died. Hopefully he watched them and got saved. I don't know. 